Thank you everyone for joining us uh, for today's webinar. Uh, we're grateful to have you join us. Um, and today we're joined by Sonia Barber, who is a teacher of sport and recreation and fitness at Central Queensland University. Uh, today, Sonia will be going through the essential framework to build your business in corporate health and fitness and add to your toolbox of the ultimate exercise professional. Thank you, Dan. It's great to be here. This is actually my first ever Oz Active webinar. Um, I might have met some of you over the years um, at Bilex and all the other wonderful things that we have been doing in the fitness industry for a long time. And for those of you who might be new to the industry, then hopefully today uh, I can give you some insights into growing your business, into, um, in, you know, why work for 50 to 100 bucks an hour and if you work for $500 an hour. Just an idea. But let's begin with the end in mind. I'm coming to you today from Cooktown or the Kugu Yalanji country, um, about four hours north of Cairns, which is my hometown. Um, and uh, it's the land of the Guju Yimitha people. So I'd like to pay my respects to uh, the elders past and present. And, um, and anyone here today that is First Nations people or Indigenous people, uh, Great to have you here and in the spirit of uh, our Indigenous Australians, let them guide us in our learning and our sharing and our collaborating in knowledge. So um, my apologies, I've put three CECs here because our Developing Corporate Health and Workplace Wellness Program on our micro-credentials platform for CQ University um, is three CECs. Uh, we've got 13 CEC courses on, um, on our platform via the CEC directory with AusActive. And... Um, this one is one CC for watching it today. So thank you for coming along. But if you want to go and do the whole course, um, then you will get the three CCs with a little quiz at the end of it. And Dan's wonderfully going to be able to put that link up for you if you wanted to sort of expand on what we cover today. So I'll maybe get a, a quick show of hands on um, who's already working in corporate health at the moment. Um, oh, I can see that. Wow, there's heaps of us here. Um, and if you're working in corporate health, if you are looking at getting into corporate health, um, and I really just wanted to share with you um, what's worked for me over the years. And I, honestly, it's just one of the most enjoyable um, ways that we could gather all of the skills in terms of our business and our group exercise and our PT and, and to tickle our brain and really work to have the outcomes of a, a strong workforce, a healthy workforce, a productive workforce, um, and also one that is cohesive. Um, people don't leave jobs um, because they don't feel valued. It's a, it's a place that they are going to every single day. So let's launch into it um, from here. Uh, all right, why doesn't that one work? First issue, here we go, maybe down here. There we go, it's working. So what's a micro-credential? Um, you're probably already very familiar with this and you've started establishing and obtaining your digital badges and our online um, electronic resume. At CQ University, um, our micro-credentials used to be called short courses and now they're those little snippets of information um, and it's a certification that's in assessed learning so that if you did the little quiz at the end of it, you would get your, um, your micro-credential as part of that. These are all taken from uh, our VET-based learning for Certificate 2, 3 and four and diploma of learning um, at CQ University we have 26 campuses and the largest footprint of a university in the country um, and my job is to pathway everybody into sports science if that's the direction that they want to go um, and how can we not love what we do this is uh, the best part about our micro credentials they are self-paced you can do them at any time they're anywhere between one two and three hours uh, and they're anywhere between $25, $45, and $95. So really affordable. Do them on your phone, on the bus, on the train. Um, late at night if you're up and early in the morning if you've had a client not show up, perhaps. High quality access to our alumni and our brain trust of the university. Obviously really affordable and that ultra flexible way of learning. There's a video in our Be Different platform to show you how you might start collecting those digital badges. If this is something that really interests you, I know that young people today, uh, this is really important to them. They're getting these digital badges before they even leave school for work readiness and really to build capacity, but to do just bits of learning along the way. We've been doing it as an industry for over 30 years with our CEC program to stay current, to stay up to date, to build our businesses, to increase our earning capacity. 
um, and to, to increase the, the intelligence of the entire workforce. So have a look around that and a little uh, shop around um, when you have a look at our platform. The digital badge and, and the entrepreneurship is all part of it and, and sharing that with your social networks to show what you've done and to be a part of a, a university network from there. Our platform's called Be Different and that's what you'll see when you would log in if you were going to do all of the other courses. And of course, we've got 250 other short courses if you have other interest areas in your life. That's what our Oz Active accredited micro credentials look like when you land there and you can see just a snippet of some of our CECs. Uh, build an outdoor fitness training program, getting it right from the start with client orientation and really getting best practice. You get that right from the start, you're going to have a client for life. Uh, the overview of the Australian Dietary Guidelines and how you can maximise within your scope of practice, how to coach your clients in their eating, how to help them achieve their, their goals and, and get great results using the Australian Dietary Guidelines, how to work with dietitians in that referral system and really to maximise um, the education process for your client as well to really understand healthy eating. You'll see managing falls risks in older adults. Uh, down the middle, um, down the bottom in the middle, you'll see our course that we're doing today in corporate health and wellness. Um, and one of my favourites that I wrote first about five years ago was collaborating with medical and allied health professionals. And it's very similar to this one in how you really can expand your business and really be seen as the health and fitness uh, professional in your community. So let's get started. Corporate health and wellness, great to hear that some of you are already working in corporate health and workplace wellness. Um, I think well-being and wellness is the buzzword of our time. Um, I think that our community and our workforces and our clients are highly educated in, in what they need to know about their health and what they can do more than ever because of the access of what's at our fingertips in terms of our phone and our desktop and, of course, the internet. Good and bad, but if you're that health professional in their life, then make sure you're the one that's giving them all the right information. You probably love what you do, and that means that you'll never work a day in your life, and that's what it says right here, that Australians will spend one third of their lives at work. And when you're loving what you do, it doesn't feel like work. But the World Health Organization, who have uh, recognised that the workplace is a priority setting for where you could be promoting health and well-being that the workplace health promotion is about fostering healthy workplace policies and supportive environments, those social determinants of health. If we're spending one third of our life at work, is it a healthy environment for us? And the mass exodus we saw with COVID in the mass resignation or whatever it was called, um, and the huge skills shortage that we have across the board in, in most industries, is there's a huge shift going on. People are, are not going to work where they're not happy anymore. So I think as the industry, we are really well placed and you're going to have a huge hook and some huge leverage on making sure that you can pick up work like this. It says down the bottom there that workplace health promotion is about fostering a healthy workplace policy and supportive environments for those three reasons. Enhancing the positive social conditions, building personal and organisational resilience. We've been tested, then let's just see who comes out the other side. And of course, the thing that you're great at and that's promoting healthy lifestyles. Walking your talk. Now, one of my favourite new sayings is if you love your job, then your job's going to love you right back. Um, and I'm sure we all have clients and times where we're tired and we don't totally gel with all of our clients and love them all completely. And that's where you think, I'm going to use my skills today. I'm just going to, it feels like an hour of work today. But honestly, that shift in our mentality that if we love what we're doing, it'll love us right back. Workplace health and wellbeing programs have the real potential to positively influence the health of an entire workforce. And I think you are well placed with your skill set to do that. More than ever in a post COVID 19 work life, it's really just about good business. Um, we want increased employee engagement that when they're there, they are connected, they're firing, they're, they're using all of their brain cells and all of their skills that there's team cohesion within all of those teams. Obviously, there's structural things that sometimes are in place for that, that prevent that, but let's work at dropping all of those barriers to make sure that everybody is healthy and everybody is feeling included. We know that there'll be reduced absenteeism. We know that there'll be increased productivity. And from a corporate image, internally and externally, it's just good business to have a healthy workplace program in place. 
the fitness industry is, is well placed more than ever because of the specialization of health and well-being programs and the way that you can parcel that up and design it specifically for each workplace, small and large, for them to really value their human capital. What we're going to talk about today is the evidence-based approaches to corporate health and well-being, which businesses speak about this. They talk about quality frameworks. They think about where's the evidence of this, what's the best practice, a little bit of pressure on what their competition might be doing as well, um, any edge on their competition, um, but getting the most out of their workforce. And we're going to look at some frightening statistics that cost the business and so that how they can prevent that. It's really important for the fitness industry to demonstrate that we are educated, that we're up to date, that we're validated, that we are professional, and that we can provide an organizational approach to health and fitness programming that they maybe don't even know about, and that we are going to deliver a product that they're not going to be able to live without. We're going to speak the speak and walk the talk that they do, and we're going to talk about a national perspective um, on productivity. Now, I wrote this, this course about five years ago. Some of this uh, data is a little bit old so that we can revisit some of this on uh, our resources with Safe Work Australia and also SANE Australia. But you know more than ever at the coalface of what you're seeing in your gyms and with your clients that like many developed nations, Australia is currently witnessing a significant increase in the burden of chronic disease on our healthcare system. We're seeing those changes with Medicare. We're seeing changes with NDIS. We can lighten the load on that and people are going to be willing to pay for it. In the um, Australian Institute of Health and Wellbeing report of 2010, they found that 96% of the working age Australians had at least one chronic disease uh, and risk factors aligned with that, and 72% had two or more, multiple risk factors. Now, we're talking about the modifiable risk factors, the health-related burden. Hospitals are full of health-related disease. Um, the modifiable risk factors causing the greatest burden, smoking, alcohol, poor diet, physical inactivity, and being overweight. Um, we know that the major contributors to chronic disease are the risk factors that reduce productivity and participation in the workforce. This is completely preventable, completely reversible once you start moving. We know that every workout lowers your blood pressure. Every single workout lowers your blood sugar. And we know that having that day on day and those healthy behaviors that not everybody has, that you have the expertise in coaching and leadership to do, is going to reduce those modifiable risk factors. There's a recognized two-way relationship between many of the risk factors um, and mental health disorders like depression, which is appalling. And we know the mental health stats now after COVID. Um, and I think that that's another huge leverage for us to get into business and to get into some large organizations to start using your skills on a whole and being paid for it. Adequate physical activity is at the very heart of good health promotion, good promoting of emotional well-being, and assisting in the prevention and management of 20 or more medical conditions and diseases. Now, you know this stuff. You've done your qualifications, ongoing study, and you're dealing with it every day. But this is the information that you have to take to the companies and use it as your leverage to get this kind of work. What does it cost? The Australian statistics, we know from a national perspective, um, that this situation is a tremendous concern, um, particularly given the well-recognised relationship between poor health and diminished workplace attendance, participation, workplace performance, and the estimated cost of absenteeism. And I hope you're sitting down to the Australian economy is $7 billion a year. Again, this, this information is a, a bit older, around 2015, and I wrote this course around 2018. Um, and the cost of presenteeism, and we know what that is, showing up, not feeling great, probably hung over, uh, haven't moved for five days, uh, haven't eaten well, haven't slept well, but you're showing up anyway, is five times that cost. So people that are still there, but really not productive at $34 billion a year in our economy alone. We're a small economy, we're a small population. Workplaces everywhere are feeling the impact of the current um, health concerns for our workforce but even more so post-COVID. And you're seeing this in communities and cities, small and large, smaller communities, maybe more so. And if you're in a smaller community, you're that person. You're that person that should be getting the whole town, the whole workforce well. Reduced productivity, high stress levels, poor job satisfaction, an increased sickness and an awareness of sickness post-COVID that we're very aware of not spreading infection, uh, growing absenteeism, 
uh, high staff turnover, which is a huge cost training people up over and over again. And of course, the mistakes that we would make because of physical and mental fatigue, all cost money. So every sick day in Australia costs $385. Again, this is about five years old, this number. Uh, everything's gone up, so has the cost of living, but not the cost of wages because we're not receiving any more. So that might be very similar. $385 per employee. Pre-COVID, one in 40 people took a sick day in Australia today. So how many of us are on here? Wonder who didn't show up. In the fitness industry, genuinely unwell, of course. This is my favorite part. Companies with health and wellness programs will return $5 for every dollar spent. So there is no argument for that's expensive. Well, it's $385 a day every time someone takes a day off for one person. So there's your leverage straight up. There is your pitch. There is your sales. There is your in. And these are the people that we're going to show you who to speak to to be able to sell your product and sell your program. A workplace's healthiest staff are three times more productive than its unhealthiest staff. That was staggering for me. But again, this is our business. This is our core business. We would know that. Australian workers are losing more than three days a year just to workplace stress alone. So workload because someone else is off sick, because someone else isn't productive, that's then going to load that next person up. Three days a year just in stress. So that's every quarter. Someone's taken a day off just because of the load. Workplace stress in Australia costs, and this is from Sane Australia, these statistics, $15 billion a year. Depression causes one in five people to work at 40% capacity, less than half with the mental load of what uh, mental health disorders like depression can cause. Obesity was an interesting one, resulting in an average work impairment of 12% from the immobility and the lower energy levels of carrying around excess body weight. And on average, we're all taking 10 and a half sick days every year. Presenteeism, we talked a little bit about before. What does it look like? Um, we know it's low energy, turning up anyway, just turning up for work, showing up, taking lots of cigarette breaks, drinking too much coffee, not drinking enough water, not moving enough in the day, sitting down all day. How, we know what that's going to do. We know that the inactivity levels in Australians are more dangerous now than if we all started smoking. Now, we've long known the health impacts of smoking, but not quite as aware of what the impacts of not moving enough. We're supposed to do 10,000 steps a day. Australians are doing on average 3,000 steps a day. That's not enough to get our minimum of 150 minutes of exercise per week for the health benefit of just living a long, healthy life. We know that presenteeism looks like low energy, like fatigue, like a lack of work-life balance. It looks like someone is stressed and overloaded. It, it results in poor decision-making, poor communication, poor teamwork. It looks like a lack of motivation and a lack of connection to the workforce or the organisation that that person is part of. And that's what's costing $34 billion a year to the Australian economy. What does it look like in one workplace? Now, this would be a large organisation, of course, obviously not smaller communities like mine, but in an organisation with 750 people, if just 2% were absent every day, that's 15 people every day. Now, that's got an impact across the organisation, someone in every team. And that's a $7,000 cost to that business and $1.8 million annually in trying to cover that and then loading everybody else up as well. So how do we sell it? What can we do about it? And this is the skill set that you have. And this is the vibrancy and the dynamics and the brain power and the skills that you have to get into these businesses. Healthy people. Uh, this was actually the name of my business when I was still working in the industry. Healthy people, healthy places. And this is exactly what we did to get into corporate health and into community fitness programs. This is how you're going to sell it. A workplace healthier staff are three times more productive than those who aren't. Disengaged employees have rates of absenteeism that are 27% higher than their peers. And we know the ones that they are. Sadly, it's really obvious. Workplace wellness engages people. An engaged workforce is a team-built workforce, is a strong workforce. People doing interesting work are not inclined to be absent. If they're plugged into their projects and they're plugged into the worth of their work, if they feel valued by their organisation, they don't feel like wagging. 
Companies with health and wellness programs we spoke about before have a $5 return for every dollar invested. So instead of costing money in absenteeism and presenteeism, investing in this program, and we'll have a look at some structures in a minute, they're going to get that return fivefold. Organisations with wellness programs in place had a 2.5% better performance when they were studied and reviewed, and that's year on year. So that's an improvement. Like they, you know, 10% in four years. Creativity and innovation was 3.5% um, 3.5 times higher. And we want those new innovative ideas in the world of technology and the world of doing things better and smarter and faster and more engaging. Uh, that's the stuff that you're going to get with a workforce that is engaged and is healthy. And then of course the retention of talent was four times higher over a four month over a 12 month period. Uh, not having to keep training people and that staff turnover was really, really reduced. That's your sales pitch. You don't have to use them all. You might know a bit about a company, you might have done your research, you might have a client that's in your ear complaining about their workforce and their workplace all the time. And they don't want to leave their job. They love their job. But this is these are reversible, preventable problems to have. And you can fix them as the corporate health trainer. All right. So the growth in the corporate health and wellbeing sector and the services that you can offer is really just what the doctor ordered. And if the doctor is the one with the credibility, then you are going to be the practitioner that can deliver it. This was in the financial review and the Corporate Wellness Australia Chief Executive Wayne Dart says five or six years ago, the biggest demand was for one-off services like massages at your desk or group fitness with Pilates and yoga in the boardroom or running a touch football game or a hike on weekends to get everybody and do a bit of team building. Um, was really no real emphasis on measuring the benefit. Obviously it works, obviously it's great, but there really wasn't any evidence to record how good that was for the workforce other than, oh yeah, we felt great. Oh, my business is pretty good but it needs to become part of the business, part of the culture. Clients are really looking now for that 12-month measurable, manageable wholesale program, which you can design and offer. And obviously then there's a sustainable income for you in building that relationship with the business that interlinks with the overall company's objectives and targets. And you look up their objectives and targets and you put the words that they use into your pitch and into your proposal and into your project management so that it aligns with what that company is doing. They want to educate people and set goals and targets for their employees in exactly the same way as they expect productivity. Their health could be that literacy. There's the full article there and I'll be able to share this uh, presentation with you after today so that you can have a look at that. Some of the questions that arise in that pitch phase and when you're really proposing what you need to be doing and what is great for that workforce is it uh, workplace wellness or is it risk management? And what are those things that overarch everything? Just on that little graph there, you can see how it is all interwoven. But the impact of ill health on the bottom line, what did I put there, the boot line? Spell check on the bottom line or the genuine commitment to staff wellbeing. Companies are really motivated to jump on the corporate wellness bandwagon. The result is great high performers, good staff retention, improved health and well-being of their human capital, that that is their biggest cost and their biggest asset. It can't just be seen as a cost. It has got that five-fold potential to be better. With workplace wellness, the hinging part right in the middle of that complex scheme. Now, if we were to have a look at a, an evidence-based approach um, in terms of corporate health and workplace wellness, one of the better ones I've seen in a long time is the Queensland Government's Healthier, Happier Workplaces. You can have a look at this. This is available for everybody. And they compiled a, a, a really good evidence-based approach to workplace health and wellbeing with the contemporary best practice. It has those five steps to it in terms of getting the management's commitment, really getting them on board and getting buy-in. So there's probably a few meetings to have, a few pitches to have, a few presentations to management to get them on board using your evidence that you've got of every stat and every bit of information I've shared here and any more, uh, much more that you can probably find from your local community and from the Bureau of Statistics. That this wellness planning has gone into play based on what the needs assessment would be there in step three. 
what the action plan is and the stuff that you're really good at on where those fitness assessments might take place, where the Pilates in the boardroom takes place, where the hikes on weekends, where the touch football game happens, where the boxing circuit happens, whether there is PT for executives, um, what, what, are the, what are the needs that come out of that? And then your expertise is in the program. It's in the delivery. That's what's going to hook them in because they're going to feel amazing evaluation of the program constantly um, to make sure that you're feeding back and you're, you're capturing all of the positives so that you can sustain this program and keep this income and this business and a big, hopefully a big chunk of your income and business keeping going, a sustainable program from here on. This is maybe what it looks like in terms of the five steps to being a happier, healthy workplace. And who doesn't want that? That first step there that you've got in terms of the management commitment, really gaining the program from all levels of management. So there has to be quite a big buy-in. So there might be lots of meetings and lots of presentations to do in large companies, maybe not so much in smaller companies. And maybe if you don't get the right decision maker, make sure you get the right decision maker. That there's wellness planning that goes into that. And that's how you really want to structure your program and all the resources that you're going to need to make sure that this is a really sustainable program. It's an inclusive program and it's really broad in making sure that there's something for everybody. The needs assessments that might take place. And there's a great example there on the website in the Healthy Places Survey. So the Healthy People, Healthy Places Survey, you could use some of that. It might not suit the businesses that you're targeting, but you might structure something in the way that, uh, that you need to and you add your mojo to it and you add your connection and your ability to connect with people and groups. But um, those priority areas can be really identified there in the needs assessment of the business. What do they need and what do they want in a health program? And then, of course, your plan, your plan of action. What are you going to put into place that's going to have that business on fire? High-performing, motivated, healthy people. And then, of course, those evaluations. Are they going to take place quarterly, every six months, every, every nine months, every 12 months? When are you going to evaluate the effectiveness of your program and report back to management to show them the statistics? Um, you, there'll be some privacy issues involved in people's individual personal health information. Um, and as fitness professionals, we will be able to do that um, diagnostically and, and, and objectively. All righty. So two in three of Australian adults were overweight or obese in 2014-15. I wrote this course just a couple of years after that. So obviously we've got um, more up-to-date statistics but what do you need in workplace wellness programs? What we need to know now and what I really want you to know is that wellness is more than just physical health. It's about our overall state of well-being that really enables us to live and to function at our best. And I think if you're pitching that to any executive, how could they disagree with investing in that and for very little cost? Because have a look at the cost of if they don't do it. A lack of wellness affects many Australians across our diverse communities this transfers into our workplaces where we spend one third of our life and contributes to unhealthy work environments, potentially toxic work environments, and of course, the organisational culture. Who doesn't want to know that they work somewhere great? And in terms of the owners and the management and the executive, don't they want to feel proud that they've got an organisation that looks after their people, their human capital? Now, in a post-COVID workplace, how does this look? So obviously that changed the world. Do we need, and we're probably sick of Zooming, and here we are Zooming, but we're fitting it in as best we can. Do employees need online support or face-to-face? -face? Any ideas about that one out there? Online or face-to-face -face or both? Do organisations really want to engage in real human behavioural change and personal connections to health and wellbeing? What do you guys think the most effective workplace wellness program would be? Because what we don't know that it is, it's not having to tick boxes on their brand of organisation of having a health and wellbeing program as advertised, promoted, and in an opt-in, opt-out for employees. Uh, some organisations might run an Are You OK Day. But in conflict with that is nothing in that organisation looks after the mental health and physical well-being of their workforce on any other day. And they want to show up on Are You OK Day and put a few cakes and sausage rolls and party pies out and say, Are You OK? Great. 
see you next year and then do nothing about it. We know this is serious. And this is your opportunity to make a change. And if they don't want to do it and they don't know how to do it, you do. You know what to do. And here's some tools to do it. Um, do workplace wellness programs actually work? So you might come up against this, like that doesn't work. That's not going to do anything for my bottom line. But we have the evidence to prove that it does. There was an ABC News story on standing desks and office yoga classes and gym memberships were all the things to have on offer at work. And the jury is still out on whether they actually made us healthier and better at our jobs at that point in time. We, we know absolutely they make us better at our jobs and healthier overall. If you're spending that much time at work and in the commute, it might have to be done on work time. A growing body of research actually suggests without a targeted, well-thought-out approach, similar to that five-step plan in the Queensland Government's Happy Healthy Workforce, the workplace wellness initiatives will often yield those results. Em ignoring employee health costs much more money. The full article's there and we'll, show, we'll share these slides with you again, of course. There was another case study on how companies will approach uh, wellbeing. Uh, the National Australia Bank had My Health and Wellbeing and it was a program that had an access to an online portal incorporating a health risk assessment. So it was really subjective. Um, behaviour change programs were able to be put in place and the coaching that backed that up. Fact sheets were available, on-site physical activities and physical assessments. Um, and that was a very successful approach. Um, hopefully that is still going because changes of management and that was pre-COVID, but we knew that that got uh, excellent outcomes for their workforce. The full article's there for that one as well. Our mental health and workplace wellness uh, resources that are on Safe Work Australia and SANE Australia are fantastic. Safe Work Australia says with more and more evidence and information and education about mental health in Australia, Safe Work Australia have published a workplace guide to support mental health risk factors at work. Make the most of these resources. They are excellent. They are your evidence for your sales pitch and perhaps your in and the leverage of the organisations and the companies that you would like to pitch this to. SANE Australia are driving programs for mentally healthy workplaces, helping to change attitudes and educate uh, to prevent the stigma attached to mental illness. I really think this is working. Um, what do you guys think? Maybe put this in the chat and maybe we can have a little discussion about this with our Q&A shortly, but especially in the workplace. I think that we are definitely reducing and lowering those barriers around uh, mental health time off required when we may or may not be coping. We did forget to say that we are having a Q&A at the end and we were going to save that at the end. So sorry if we didn't mention that at the start and you're hanging there with a question. We are coming to you. Some of the innovations and um, the corporate health workplace programs that you could offer. Now, I can hand on heart say that I've worked with all of these and they're all successful. So if we can talk about some of them and then maybe you take those away, um, these could be just the start of how you might break the seal and get into the organisation. This might be part of the ongoing program. This might be something that you might be missing in a corporate health program that you're already doing and you think, oh, I could add that in as well and that'll make sure they'll sign up again for another year or another six months or, or really add some some shake it up and some pizzazz to the program that you're already delivering. So health seminars, umpteen thousand topics that you could cover that'll come from the workforce in things that they might need to know about how to train in the gym. Nutrition, you bring in a guest speaker in a dietitian, that you bring in um, some hearing testing and eye testing and you're adding that value to it. Um, that you have a team building kind of day attached to a health seminar, that you have a healthy cooking session there and they've got a lovely kitchen in there and you're making smoothies and, and demonstrating how quick and easy it is to make a healthy meal if that's your thing. What corporate nutrition could look like in supporting a healthy environment for making sure that nutrition is top of mind and that we now know it's a 90-10 situation. In the 80s, we said it was 50-50, training, eating. Then maybe it was a bit 70-30 and then, oh, it's 80-20. But we now know food. It's all about the food. We are eating food-like substances in our, in our modern life and we have to get back to eating 
basic plant-based healthy food, balanced healthy food. 10,000 steps competitions for a bit of team building, um, a, a 10 week challenge for that, a walk around Australia, 10,000 steps. Everyone's wearing their wearable tech uh, so they can see how many they're doing. Corporate personal training programs, um, a little bit of healthy competition in there. If you're having a row test and you say, well, so and so did their 1,000 meters in this and their 500 meters in that. Uh, corporate gym memberships, these are some of the obvious ones. Executive health assessments, so you might be into the whole organisation if you just concentrated on the executive team to start with and that they feel fantastic and then they think, well, if I feel this good, my entire workforce is going to do this for me. Managers health assessments, on-site corporate fitness club, helping them set up their gym so that they would have an understanding that they could have a break, go and do half an hour in their, their, their small gym that they've got set up on-site. Health risk assessments, so some screening and some surveys um, set up for the company. That could be your in. Workplace health checks with your blood pressure and your body composition and your tape measure, um, your flexibility and range of motion. Um, and then you make recommendations based on, on the results of that. Corporate adventures and hikes, some corporate team building activities on fun days every quarter, and they might just fall in love with you there. Healthy behaviour change programs where you might bring in a psychologist and, and really talk through a lot of that problem solving to, to create new healthy behaviours online or face-to-face. -face. Uh, personality health checks are really trendy and really fun lately on the sorts of things you need based on the, the way you are motivated. Healthy hearts, um, that's targeted heart foundation programming for health interventions um, for, for reducing heart disease. And then, of course, you might um, link everything you do as the corporate health person that's responsible for health in an organisation. Everything is linked to a World Health Organisation calendar event. If it's Diabetes Day, it's awareness on that. If it's Anti-Stroke um, Awareness Day, if it's Child Cancer, if it's Genes for Genes, if it's Mental Health Day, if it's Are You Okay Day, that you've got an opportunity a couple of times a month for a calendar event that you can link what is going on as a health promoting workplace, not just that one a year where you crack out the party pies and the sausage rolls and ask, are you okay? It has to be a cultural shift and a cultural change. Oh, that came around fast. Didn't that come around fast? Now, um, I actually just saw the chat rolling on quickly and I can see that there's some in the Q&A section and the lovely Dan is going to drive that for us um, and then I will be, and he's been monitoring the chat there as well. So if there's any questions that have popped up there, we might be able to drag those across. But Dan, I might throw over to you because you can see them. Yes. Well, great. First of all, great session, Sonia. Lots of great comments coming in. So people, um, I hope everyone's enjoyed that. I've learned um, some stuff as well myself. Um, I thought I'll just quick uh, kick off with this one. Um, my, uh, this is from uh, Malisha. It's well, Malisha. I hope I've got that right. My question is, how do you approach um, the big companies, uh, cold email, call, um, et cetera? Also, if there's a template to this first approach. Yeah, absolutely. So stalking is probably illegal. So we don't, we try not to do that, but it's a good way to start. So in terms of the big companies, they will have, um, they might have a health and wellbeing committee that you might want to try and find out how um, someone you know that might work in that organisation. It really is about that relationship building. Sadly, the cold emails and the cold calls don't work. But persistence, persistence, persistence. If you really want an organisation, I'm certain you will find someone that is connected in there. So maybe if you're close by to that big organisation, they're in your vicinity, they're close to your gym, they're close to where you work. You want to find out who the HR manager is. You want to find out who the workplace health and safety warden is. You want to find out if there is a, a anything proactive going on in that organisation already and you find out who's managing or leading that team. So there might be a health and wellbeing officer. Um, on our campus, we have a health and wellbeing coordinator. That's something that someone put their hand up to do. Everyone has to have a workplace health and safety officer that has to report on safety. Well, poor mental health and being overworked and stressed is a workplace health and safety issue. And if they haven't figured that out already, then that's your in. Um, but I would try and stick to the companies where you have a connection because that human connection is already there. So someone that you know who knows someone who works there, 
and you really massage those relationships and see if you can pitch them on their are you okay day you come and do a health presentation you might pitch them on their team building day or they've got an in service often they'll be off site or they've got some staff training and you ask to go and do a session for free um, at their in service day or their training day does that help Alicia that's a great great answer Sonia um, one of the um the earlier questions um, was, uh, do you have any short courses on core values uh, slash goal setting slash life aspects? Um, Actually, yeah, and one of our short courses is called Get It Right From The Start. And it's, an, it's a bit of a grab on the client orientation and health screening from our initial certificate three in fitness, but it is my favourite unit to teach as a fitness teacher because I really want to help everyone get it right from the start. Um, one of my favourite ones is that when we might do all of the goal setting and the lifestyle screening and, of course, using the Oz Active Australian, um, the APSS, so the Adult uh, Physical Activity Screening System, very important that we're using all of those best practice tools. But then you might be doing their health check, which is their blood pressure, their body composition, tape measure, flexibility test, strength test, cardio test, then flip the page over and do a health check. And it stands for C-H-E-C-K. What changes do they want to see happen in the next four weeks? So you've done a physical test. Absolutely, the numbers can't lie. But what would they like to see change? What would they like to feel healthier for? What would they like to enjoy? What is the challenge? And what do they know more? So I probably should have been more prepared, but it looks a little bit like this. Got you on the fly, Sonia. <laughs> Can you see that? Oh, back to front. Look at that. Health across the top and then check. What changes do they want to see? How much healthier do they want to be in the next four to six weeks until you do their next fitness assessment? What do they want to have a bit of fun with? What are they going to enjoy? What is the challenge? Now, this is two-pronged. You probably have a totally pumped workforce client whatever that says right what is the challenge you want to set yourself in the next four weeks you know the client I'm talking about they're pretty compliant they're really excited about their program or stressed out tired mum busy executive you ask them what are the challenges that are going to get in the way of you sticking to this program in the next four weeks and let's be honest what are they is it time is it money is it energy is it alcohol is it kids what is it is it transport what are the challenges so it could be what do you want to do in the next four weeks or what's going to get in the way and the last one is knowledge what do you want to know more about training about yourself about nutrition about recovery what do you want to know more in the next voice to set yourself up for success so that you don't have to keep paying me 50 to 100 bucks an hour to train you so that you become self-sufficient so the health check is not just the numbers of blood pressure, body composition, measurements, fitness tests, beating their goals, because the month they lose no centimetres and they're stressed and maybe even gain weight, you flip this page over and on the back, you say, look at the changes you actually made happen in your life. Does that help? It's a great, um, great example there, Sonia. I think people in the chat are they're saying that they love that. So. Um, that's great I stole hear. it. It's not mine. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. I actually That's... stole that from uh, Paul Brown, Mr. Retention. Uh, I went to a Filex in, I think it was 1998. Some of our members on here probably weren't even born. Dan, you probably weren't even born. And, uh, <laughs> and I use that in my personal training business every single month. So that was often my hook um, on a corporate health day. We would talk about the numbers and I would say that we can talk about the numbers. We can get your blood pressure down. We can help you lose weight. We can get you fit. We can get you fast. you got to show up, but let's really do a health check. What's going on in your head? Because that is the only thing that's going to get in your way. My head is what gets in my way as well. Uh, <laughs> all of us, Dan. <laughs> it's all of us. <laughs> um, Mary um, had a question um, and uh, 
it was, uh, do we have a link to that Happier Healthier uh, Workplaces site? And um, if you do, Sonia, what we'll do is we'll, because um, there's another question about um, a copy of the today's slides, what we'll do is we'll put the link to that website and the slides from today um, into a, an email out to everyone who registered or, or attended today. So we'll get you those um, information. Um, Absolutely. I'm happy to share all of the slides and the links were on the slides. Um, I don't think the link for the Happy and Healthier was there, but that is the name of the program. If you Googled that, you would find that exact free information available for everybody. Great. Um, there was another question uh, from Chris Walker. Uh, what advice would you have for an opening line for personal avatars on LinkedIn for the first intro message? Oh, I'm going to confess here, I'm not great with LinkedIn. Um, as a personal trainer, how you would, what you would put up for yourself. What is your USP, Chris? What is your unique selling point? The thing that you have that nobody else has. What makes you stand out from everyone around you? And if it's around a competitive thing because you want someone to grab you off LinkedIn, then what is going to stand out? And of course, um, we see too much of that. Oh, great professional service, good customer service, uh, qualified, Cert 3 and 4 trainer. Good. You should be. You should be offering great customer service. You should be professional. You should be registered. You should be qualified. Don't waste your time putting any of that stuff on your LinkedIn. That should be assumed. What is your unique selling point that makes you stand out as a great trainer? How do you connect with people? How are you going to help someone get results? What makes you a great coach? Does that help? I hope so. <laughs> I should get on LinkedIn and have a look at that. It helps, <laughs> yeah. Chris. And I bet you're amazing, Chris. So find your amazing, then put that up there. Chris, uh, Chris has just one that says, sweet, thank you. So good answer there. Um, this one, I'm not sure um, what this might have been linking to, but it was from John Duncalf. He asked, how successful in gaining honest input from subjects? So I'm, I'm, apologies, I don't know what part that might have been referring to in your session, but the, that was the gaining honest input from subjects honesty input from subjects so i'm i'm guessing um that john might mean if you are asking the exec oh okay so maybe when you're doing a survey perhaps of the actual um workforce and you're getting honest answers when you're doing maybe an online health survey or they have to put in um, subjective assessment so it's it's obviously very difficult to be subjective about yourself because you are um, sorry it's difficult to be objective about yourself so we've all got those clients that love to unzip their body hand the skin over to their trainer and say could you just fix my body up and I'm going to just going to go and live my life and eat and drink and be merry and work hard and I'll be back to pick my body up in a month and I'll put it back on and hopefully it looks great um, wouldn't that be amazing so the honesty of our of our clients is is absolute. So of all the hours in the day that we might see them for one hour a day, we might even only see them for two hours a week. So the honesty um, is in your integrity and in the way that you're going to deliver this program that you say to them, you're going to give them 10 hours a week. You're just asking for three back from them um, and that you really can share your soul and really share your your honesty and your integrity on how you're going to deliver that program and how you're going to use that information to write a fantastic program. So all you're asking from them is to show up and do as you ask um, and that this is their health we're talking about. This is their life. So I'm imagining that's what John might mean. I hope so, John. I hope so too. It sounded like a good answer anyway. Um, the uh, next one was from Lucinda. Um, they ask, what are the best levers or levers for changing culture, for example, sitting culture? Yeah, um, obviously stand up best are all the rage, but some, um, I think go in and offer a 10,000 steps challenge. We do a thousand steps every 10 minutes. So all they have to do is get away from their desk, um, perhaps 10 times a day to just go to the copier and, and move around and make sure they're getting up every half an hour. Sitting culture um, go in with those researched evidence-based stats that sitting is now more dangerous for our health than if we all started smoking a packet of cigarettes a day. So that's where the research is at for Australians sitting too much, uh, not moving 10,000 steps, only doing 3,000 steps on average a day. Uh, I find that just staggering. So we're looking at 10,000 steps being about eight kilometres a day. And now we're not talking about workouts. We're just talking about incidental movement. 
So the time that it takes you to get to the car park and when you use the stairs instead of the lift, if you're that change maker, shame people out of using the lift. <laughs> Obviously, if they're able-bodied, um, say, no, don't use the lift. There's the stairs over there. Put some signs up. If you're the person in the workforce that is the wellbeing officer or you're the corporate trainer that has been given a green light to change culture, start putting those signs up. Stairs over there putting pictures up of um, you know, the calories that might be burned and the steps that might be obtained by moving every 30 minutes. I hope that helps because um, CQ University actually started the 10,000 Steps program. And I forgot about that until I started working at CQ University five years ago. Uh, 10,000 Steps is very, very achievable for anybody. And if that is the first health goal that they have and they have wearable tech or they have a $10 pedometer on to monitor that, then that is um, one of the best things that they can start to do for their health, incidental movement. Yeah, great one. Um, Sonia, I think um, uh, there's another question from Debbie. Is there a calendar that has um, all of the health days? Um, and I thought I'd, I'd just quickly add in there as well that, um, you know, there are there is all the challenges, but then also things like, you know, Pilates days or, or you know, International Yoga Day, things like that are also a good sort of chance to mix up you know, maybe what you're doing as well. But um, yeah, I guess the question was, is there a calendar that has all the health days? Absolutely. There's Australian calendars or there's the World Health Organization calendar. So if you want to have more of a global approach so that you're part of the global community, you want to have an Australian calendar so that you can access mostly, and I think in many cases, the resources are free, um, a Movember challenge so that all the guys are growing their mows or dance is pretty impressive. Um, if they're growing their mows in Movember and you're talking about men's mental health and the Black Dog Institute and prostate cancer, like they're fantastic. And you get a barista in, um, our IT guy dressed up in a wig and, a, um, and, a, and an apron and came and ran coffee for the, for the week. So it was just a real all in and an awareness around having that local champion. And you might tap someone on the shoulder to be the champion for those different calendars of events. Um, we just recently had endometriosis awareness week because of the clinics that are being opened all around Australia. Get a women's health physio in and put a free lunchtime speaker on with a women's health physio or someone who's a representative from that clinic. And I guarantee you they'll say exercise is good for your endometriosis. I'm a trainer over here. I can help you out with that. Um, let's get a healthy workplace program going. 50% of your workforce at least hopefully is women and a staggering amount are affected by that. But there is definitely Australian calendars and just Google Australian health calendars, Australian health events, and the World Health Organization will have the World Health Day. So we often line in with the uh, global health community as well. Yeah, that's great. So yeah, there's lots of websites out there that, that um, I've come across as well. So um, yeah, give them a Google and I'm sure you'll track um, one down. Um, I think what might be the last question, but um, yeah, we've still got a few minutes. So if you do, if anyone does have any questions, please pop them in. Um, uh, from Robin Thomas, uh, in corporate workplaces, some employees are reluctant or nervous to exercise with colleagues. Um, what strategies can you use uh, for these people? Yeah, and, and these things will come out of the survey. So I think it's really easy to assume and you're very right. There'll be some people that they don't want to socialise with the people they work with. <laughs> it's like they go to work to be at work. There are introverts, empaths, um, extroverts. So these might be your, your leaders. Um, and I think through the workplace survey that you'll run and that link for a workplace survey will be on that Queensland government site or you make up your own workplace survey based on some of them that you'll find. Um, they'll be really honest about that. Do you prefer exercising in groups or on your own? And then based on the results that you'll get out of your survey from that workplace, that's what you present back to the executive. That's what you present back to the health and wellbeing committee that's throwing it out there to see what sort of program they're going to run for their workforce. And you say, actually, 60% of your, your workforce don't like exercising in groups. And they think, oh, okay, so you probably need to start subsidising either a gym membership or some personal training or at the very least a program set up individually because that's how those people are going to move on a regular basis. But 40% want a group. So let's start a weekly group session a week for those who love socialising and exercising in groups, but really your workforce came back with a high percentage. So really base it on your evidence constantly based on the survey that you gave to that workplace. 
Great answer. Um, Sonia, I think one of the last, uh, I think two sort of questions have just come in similar nature. Um, Jacqueline's asked um, about pricing and um, also Emily has asked, uh, how do you structure costing? So I, I think they might be talking about the same um, thing there. Is there a good place to start? Um, yeah, that? I mean, you know what your hourly rates are um, and you know what you like to charge if you're a personal trainer. Uh, you then might have a rate that you have for groups as well as your little bit of a basis. What do you want to be earning in that hour? Have a think about the time that it takes to communicate with that workforce, um, the email follow-ups, the time to travel there, the, the surveys that might go into that. So it might have a whole of project approach to it. And lots of companies might come back to you with, um, is, is Fitness Passport national or just Queensland? I think there's they operate um, across Australia. Yeah. Yeah. So they might be a fitness passport organisation, and everyone might pay you and fitness passport as their provider, um, and then you might need a top up of that based on how many people you get. You might say this program is worth and and think big. This this program is worth ten thousand dollars this year, um, and it's going to involve this 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 and this. And the company thinks, all right, well, I'll, we'll give you five. And will the the employees that come on board they can pay for the rest, and it might seem then it's really affordable, um, and and have it and add the whole thing up as a project. Here's the group session we're going to do once or twice a week. The initial health assessments with the twenty people that are jumping on board on this program, or forty, or fifty, or a hundred. How long is that time going to take me? And package it up in a whole lot, and it doesn't look that scary. You pitch that to an organisation that spends a hundred thousand dollars a year on their internet. That's not that's not going to be a lot. If you tell them it's going to cost them three hundred eighty five dollars a day for every person they're off sick, you start to leverage the costs of that. So if you're going in with a five thousand, ten thousand, twenty thousand dollar twelve month plan to look after a workforce, and they say, all right, well we'll give you ten, and then you can get the other ten out of the employees. Divide that by two hundred employees. It all of a sudden looks very affordable for them to direct debit that every week to pay for that upfront. But per hour, you should you should not be working less than $250 an hour for the effort you're going to put into a corporate health program. Now, you may not feel confident with that. You might start at the low end of $100 a session. If you think this is new to me, I'm really going to get this started with a really small business to start with. Um, but have a think about the work and the effort you're putting into it before that. So 100, 150, it would be a really great start. 250 and above for experienced trainers. Honestly, you should be working for three or four hundred dollars an hour at least in group programs. Does that help? I'm sure it does. So I know yeah, what I think you're worth anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you think about people will go out and have a spend 150 bucks on dinner. No, yeah. Like, and wine. So I don't feel bad about that at all. <laughs> I'm just um, conscious of time, but. Um, just got one uh, a question about insurance. Um, do you need a different level of insurance to operate in the corporate uh, premise? What way out of my field there wouldn't have a clue. The corporate business will probably ask the same question. So they'll need to ask their insurer what activities they can run on their workplace. Um, they might then say, no, we're not running that. That has to be run on your workplace. I imagine then they would just come under as a, a normal group, but you're going to have to talk to your insurer about that. Um, but the business, if it's on site on theirs, then the, the organisation will have to ask their insurer about that. Sorry, outside of my scope, that one. Always good to refer, Sonia. And yeah, um, you know, give Guild Insurance a call, who is one of our partners. I'm sure they'll be able to, to guide you on that as well. Um, how's your, how are you for time, Sonia? Should we? You're I'm great. great. You're great. Um, I, I love to read all the, the chat comments as well. I haven't been able to do two things at once. My ADD is probably a little bit um, too much for that. But um, I'm, I'm not joking about that. Um, so I'd love to read the 99 plus chat comments there. Um, so I want to thank you all for participating today all the way from Cooktown to all around the country. Can't wait to see where you're all are listening in from. Please get in touch with me. My email is provided by Dan and all of those links will be on the presentation. And um, from my Labrador to yours, thanks very much.